Oh, Barkley's here. We can start. I'm Bill. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> well, you might have mentioned, heard us mention before that we don't, we didn't have a host. They didn't give us a host. <laughs> they took us to the Waffle House. <laughs> now we don't even have a host to open the meeting. <laughs> This has been a real miserable <laughs> situation, <laughs> but we're kind of struggling through it, you know. Why don't we start off with the serenity prayer? God, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Okay, well, this workshop is supposed to be on... Uh, spiritual recovery and intimacy in relationships. So Steve and I spent last night making stuff up for this. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I think I'm highly qualified to discuss this. I've been married three times. And <laughs> I've had a lot of experience in relationships. Um, um, first off, there are three levels of recovery. Level one is where you come in and you have a sponsor and you're working the steps and you've got commitments at meetings and you're working with others, that kind of thing. Level two is when you get it all figured out. <laughs> and when you do that for a while, level one for a while, then you trans transition into level two, which is you start telling people how to do it because now you know, right? And you don't really have to communicate with your sponsor and stuff because you know, you know, you know. Usually that happens like between five and ten years sober. People with five years sober run Alcoholics Anonymous, essentially, because they've got a lot of enthusiasm, you know. They don't have much in the way of relationships because nobody really wants to be around them much. And so they've got time, you know, and they can work in meetings and do, you know. Then after a while, you do level two for a while, you transition into level three. And level three is when you get back down to level one. Because <laughs> that's all there really is. And what happens at the end of level two, and what really makes level three, is when it all falls apart. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, is what happens when it all falls apart. Um, first off, I'd like to get this for the record. There's a lot of people that have uh, come up and talked to us. It's been really sweet about uh, getting email addresses, and Steve and I both send out some quotes daily and different stuff. So uh, I'm going to, for the record, I'll put my email address is C at kitchentableaa.com. Steve? My email address is steve.lamb at live.com. And lamb is just like sheep, but not quite as dangerous. <laughs> um, so that's out of the way. <clears throat> oh, they're a little slow you have on to, Sunday you have to, morning. You have, to, okay. you have to buy the CD. Right, you know, that's, that's what this is all about, right? We're just trying to push stuff for Lee. And, uh, it's Bill C at kitchentableaa.com. Steve.lamb at live.com. And we're not going to say it again. So... Have you ever had the situation or have you ever had someone say to you, let's describe, say you're about eight, ten years sober, doesn't have to be that though, but you've been around a while, you've been in AA for a while, you're going to meetings, you've, you've done an inventory, you've done a bunch of work and maybe you're even sponsoring people, you've been around a little bit, things, life has settled down, things are looking pretty good. And then he or she, your significant other, stands in front of you one day and looks you right in
in the eye and says something along these lines. You're not emotionally available for me. Any hands? Has that ever been? Oh, come on. The rest of you are lying. <laughs> and, uh, you know what they mean by that when they say that. There's, there, both hands are up. Let's see. More than once, huh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, this has happened to me. This has happened to me on more than one occasion. And what they mean by that when they say that is that I've got something that they want and I'm withholding it. The truth is worse. I don't have it. <laughs> and I don't know that I don't have it. You've convinced me that I've got it and I'm helping you look for it. <laughs> and this dance will go on forever. And if all I'm doing is going to 875,000 meetings a week, it'll never change. Ever. Um, what happened to me is uh, I don't know that I don't have compassion. I don't know that. I've never had it, so I, I don't know what it feels like to be compassionate. Some people call it empathy. The idea being that you can actually feel what someone else feels or put yourself in their shoes. The ability to look on the other side. What's it feel like when I speak to people like this? What's it feel like when this happens? It's hard, difficult for me. Being self-centered, the manifestation of self-centeredness is I can't do that. I'm thinking about myself constantly. And I don't know that it's anything's wrong with that. It's always been like that. So I'm having trouble with personal relationships. And I wonder why. When she said that to me, my response was, what are you talking about? I'm standing right here. I mean, we are in physical proximity to each other. So then we start making stuff up, like men are different from women, women are from Venus, men are from Mars, and we create a whole psychology around the difference between men and women. Is there a difference? Of course there is. You know, we all like that difference, mostly, you know. <laughs> You know, but then when there's trouble, when there's interaction, we blame it, like we always have, on the other person. She's emotional. You know how they are. That kind of thing. And it creates a reality around it that it's okay to have this problem because you know how she is. You know. I was like that. I'm sometimes still like that. So what do you do with that? When she's standing there, and she's asking for something I don't have. What do you do? What happens? Uh, what happened to me is I blew up my marriage. Um, I was 10 years sober, 9 or 10 years sober, an officially, uh, official AA guru, um, sponsor in half of Southern California. I'm speaking at meetings. I'm big time. I've made a name for myself in an anonymous organization. And I have bought in to the image. I believe it. Uh, I wasn't really able to laugh at myself. I could feign humor. You know, I have decent language skills so I could paint a picture that seems like I'm aware. You know, I thought I was. I thought I was clear. And, uh, and she stood in front of me and said that. And I bought the thing, well, you know how they are. Go to more meetings. Call your sponsor. You know, she was in Al-Anon. And... Uh, um, so I started looking around the rooms for something other than recovery. And I found her. She was there, like she usually is. If you're looking for that, you can find that. And I started having an affair. And the, sub and the result of that is I blew up my marriage. I had uh, two children. They were, um, I think, 11 and seven or eight, something like that. You know, the soccer kids where I got thrown off the soccer field, those kids that I was growing up with. And we had a house, a beautiful home, you know, I had a little business going and I had this family and, 
You know, I would sponsor guys to come over in my garage, and I looked, it looked really good. It looked really good. And I, I felt I didn't know that there was anything wrong. You know, I didn't think that this was a facade. And to a great degree, it wasn't. It was real. But I met her, and the thing exploded. Uh, um, I ended up in the storeroom over my office in El Segundo. Um, my uh, girlfriend dumped me. You know how they are. <laughs> you know. And uh, I ended up alone in that storeroom, and I was as ashamed and angry and hurt and bitter and embarrassed as I have ever been in my life. Uh, that's the most emotional pain I've, I've ever experienced. I mean, it, it was worse than when I got sober, the way I felt when I got sober. I was incredibly physically ill at that time, and I, but you're medicated. You're medicated. And I came into A, and everything was new and interesting and stuff, but this is, I'm 10 years sober, and I'd been clean and sober for 10 years, and I had to just sit there and feel that. And I was ashamed and, and embarrassed for myself. And one night in this storeroom, I went looking for something to cut the pain. And I looked in the medicine cabinet, and there's nothing in the med I knew there wasn't anything there, but I looked. And after I looked, then I made the phone call. And I didn't call my sponsor, God forbid. You know, you know. Uh, I called a friend. I called an AA buddy. And he asked me a question. He says, have you eaten? And I didn't know. That was an emotional blackout, a whiteout. And I really, I was in rough shape. And he came over and got me. He took me out and fed me and took me to an AA meeting. I don't remember anything we talked about. But he got me out of that storeroom. He got me out of there and took me to an AA meeting. And I really didn't want to go. I was embarrassed. I was a, a, a public figure within our little community, right? And everybody was looking at me. And people, you know, the love in AA presents itself where they're looking at you and you can see them holding back the laughter, you know, and then they just shake their head and walk away. You know, it's like that. And, uh, and I, I was angry. Uh, a couple of nights later, I went to my home group and... Um, I walked in there and there was a guy there, Mike Plank, and this guy has always had my number. He would, I would always see him looking at me across the room and just smiling and shake his head. You know, for years, he'd just smile and shake his head at me. And uh, he came up to me, he saw me, a big smile, and he throws his arms around me and he whispered in my ear, he said, Welcome to AA. We've been waiting for you. <laughs> Same thing that happened to him, or something real similar, right? Everyone gets to wear the clown suit. I keep mine in the closet, keep it dusted off, the big shoes and the red nose, and, you know, everybody gets to wear the clown suit. And uh, hopefully these days I wear it less often than in the past. But this was really, really difficult. I went to my sponsor, finally, <laughs> And uh, we were at a retreat, and I had written some stuff down. It was bad enough where I actually wrote some things down on a piece of paper, <laughs> you know. Because when you're at level two, you don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> you tell other people to write stuff down, because it's really helpful, right? And uh, so he actually said to me when I pulled out my piece of paper, he went, oh, you wrote something. And I read him my stuff, and I looked at him, and I said, I, I really need some help. I'm in trouble, and I need some help. And he said to me, go find God. My response was, look, Jay, I don't need mindless platitudes. I need some real practical help, not sniveling crap like that. I'm no newcomer. And... <laughs> This is when you hand them the hammer. 
and say, please hit me. Right? What else? Get, you know, this is true. And we were sitting down on a bench, and he stood up, and he never yelled at me. He's not a finger in the chest, you know. I think when we tell those stories, it's kind of the way we take it as compared to what really happened, you know. But he, this is true. He stood up and walked over and leaned over me, and he yelled at me. And he said, there is nothing else. You talk a good game. Go do it. And I almost hit him. I was angry. And I was embarrassed. And, and loud, arrogant people like me, the way we cover up fear and embarrassment is with rage and anger. And we yell and bluster and you know all this stuff. And then we sneak off into a corner somewhere and cry. And that's me. And uh, so what I had to do is like read the 24-hour-a-day book in the morning and get on my knees and ask for help and call my sponsor. Level one. <laughs> level one. You know, and I'm here to report to you that's all there is. There's just one level, and, uh, and we're all in it. You know. We think there's a hierarchy, don't we? We think there's, I do, <laughs> and, uh, you know, half my sponsees left me, maybe more than half, you know, and uh, it was painful. The other thing I said to him at, in, around that time is I said, you know, I think I should quit speaking at meetings. I think there's too much arrogance in it. There's too much ego. I'm just way too carried away with myself. This is not healthy for me. And I'd heard other people do that. You know, I've, I've been around other guys that said, I had to quit. This is too, you know, this is, you know, not healthy. So I said it to him, and I, I felt very <laughs> magnanimous about it. I thought, you know, I'll give this thing up. You know, I, I'll be humble. And uh, he said, you don't get to pick and choose what you will and won't do. You know, I've told you that before. If they call you, you go. He said, but I might suggest to you, why don't you try telling the truth? <laughs> I was confused by that. I said, well, I'm not lying to people. And he says, Bill, stop doing theater and start talking about what's really going on. We will understand. And I thought, what's that look like? What do I talk about? And so I got asked, and I went somewhere, and I started talking about ego. I just would throw it out there. And uh, you know how you hear speakers say, you know, I don't like doing this. This is just too painful. It's so hard for me. Don't believe them. <laughs> you know, that's just false humility couched in spiritual pride. We love this stuff. <laughs> you know, if we didn't like it, we wouldn't do it. You know, I mean... I'm the, you're all looking at me and I'm talking. What's not to like? You know? I'm just looking at you. You're looking at yeah. me? It's my little buddy. Um, so I started talking about ego and I started talking about relationships and I started telling the story about what had just happened to me. And uh, it was a cleansing thing. And you know what your reaction is? What your reaction is? You look at me and you nod your head. You know? I'll talk about ego. Half the room will groan. Because how can he say it out loud? You know? And the other half is laughing their ass off. You know? It's like, yeah, me too, man. You know? I mean, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a safe place. It's a safe place. Um, Around this time, in this period, with, oh, there was just so much turmoil in my life. You know, I lost a house. I lost, I lost a lot. I lost a lot. But it, I don't remember that. What I remember is the emotional pain. The realization when you're stone cold sober and you do something like you did when you were drinking and there's no one else to blame. There is literally, there's nowhere to go. You know, are you going to blame the girlfriend? Are you going to blame the wife? Are you going to blame, you know, you stand there and you just have to feel it. If what's happening is that we're growing up emotionally because we didn't, this is the kind of stuff that happens. Life happens to us, you know. 
I, I try to behave like I think I'm supposed to behave and I can't do it and I misbehave and I have to own it. I have to own it. You know, people will come up with all kinds of moral justification for one thing or another, you know. It's just, I did this, I have to own it. I did an inventory around that time, a real inventory. I sat down and I did a real, in my own inventory. You know, here's what's going on. I went back through my childhood. I did a, you know, I used to describe it as I did an inventory that would kill a lesser man, you know, because I needed to do it. I mean, I had, it was for me, and I'm looking for the fourth column or the third column, whatever, you know. I'm looking for my faults and mistakes because there's no one to blame. I knew enough. I did the work for 10 years. Maybe it was all ego-driven. Maybe it was all about me all the time, looking good. You know, I built another persona. I, on the street, I was the phony biker, the phony tough guy with the clip-on earring. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I became the phony AA guru. Same guy. The second one is a little healthier than the first one. I'll grant you that. And no matter what my motivation was, I did the work and I reaped the benefit of that work. When it came time to get real, I knew how to do that. I knew how to do it. I just wasn't doing it. But I knew how. And I grew up. I met my now wife. We've been together this year 25 years. And uh, I saved her from a life of aimlessly wandering from man to man. <laughs> It was sad, really. Poor girl, you know, living on her own. She was four years sober and all cute and nice and everything. And, and, uh, and we got together. She's the love of my life. You know, I respect her immensely. She's an alpha female. I'm an alpha male, or would like to think I'm an alpha male. I like the sound of alpha male, don't you like that, you know? And a uh, little gunslinger in there, you know? And, uh, and we get, came together. We, one time we went on a little vacation. We were pretty new, and we went on a, to Hawaii. We went on a canoe thing with a bunch of other people, and we were both in this canoe, and we were both trying to steer, and we got into a fight in the canoe over who was steering, and we capsized it. The other people in the other canoes were pretending like they didn't notice. <laughs> public bad behavior. And uh, we used to have screaming FU fights. The makeup was wonderful. You know? I mean, we're like, we're like, it was a high school relationship. You know, it was just wonderful. But there was fighting. There's passion in relationships. We mistake sex for intimacy. And, uh, you know, sex all by itself is really fun. You know, what's not to like? Yeah. But it's not intimacy. It can be a celebration of intimacy in a relationship. I think that's what it is. At its best form, it's, celebra it's a celebration of true intimacy. Intimacy is what? I think it's honesty. It's being honest and open, not like, here's what happened. Karen and I are coming together. She's sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, so am I. She didn't have a sponsor. She'd never worked the steps. She never shared in meetings. She didn't take birthday cakes. She didn't do any of that. She just went to AA. She had a profound spiritual experience. She had come in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous for 10 years. And then she heard the voice in a hallway at a recovery place, probably the 10th or 12th recovery place she'd been to. She, she doesn't know how many detoxes she went into. She had seizures. It was so bad. She was a bad alcoholic. She had a 0 .40 blood level, blood alcohol level when she walked into this last place. So she was filling out forms and making phone calls. It was like that. When she started telling me about herself, I called my sponsor and I went, God, she was awful. <laughs> you know, I wasn't that bad, you know. <laughs> And he said, you mean the graduate from the Oregon State Mental Institution thinks he wasn't that bad? You know, I had forgotten. So 
she wanted me to come into her world, and I have this big life. I have people in it. I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. So there was a clash. She didn't want all this. I finally, I told her, I said, I can't marry someone that hasn't done their inventory. I have a reputation to maintain. You know? I actually said that. It's the truth. Arrogance is right on the top of my character defect list. You know? So she heard me, though. What I'm trying to say, she heard me. Because I can't be the center of anyone's life. I will fail you. Ultimately, you'll fail me. If all I have is the fellowship, you'll let me down, guaranteed. This is the character defect center of the known universe. You know? And there's the illusion of intimacy in Alcoholics Anonymous because we talk about heavy shit. And we think that's intimacy. And all it is is us talking about ourselves again. That's all that is. Does it have value? Of course it does. It's a safe place. I can come and talk to you. But it's not intimacy. I think it's a step towards it. Intimacy to me is pretty selfless. And I don't know much about being selfless. Yeah. So she did her inventory. You know, She got a sponsor. She did her inventory. And, and her life began to change. She wouldn't go to women's meetings because she didn't like women. She knew her role with a man but she didn't know her role with her own gender. And that's true for a lot of men, too. You know? Her sponsor made her go to a woman's meeting. She hated it. She'd come home at night, and she just hated it. And then one night, she's, making, she's wrapping a little present, and it was a porcelain figurine with a number on it. And I said, what are you doing? She goes, well, it's Julie's birthday tonight, and I bought her this thing. And I went, whoa. What happened? What hap she was changing right in front of me. She was evolving and changing. She developed her own world. Pretty soon one day I was working on my race car out in the garage and she walked out on the back porch of the house that we were renting at the time. And She had the portable phone. This is before cell phones. She had the portable phone and she had their dog on the freeway look. Somebody was on the phone with her and she was scared. And I walked up to her and I said, just say yes. Just say yes. And it was the first girl asking her to sponsor her. We live in a house today like the house I grew up in in Westchester when my parents were sober. She sponsors a lot of women. I sponsor a lot of guys. We try to keep them separated, you know. <laughs> She'll try and set them up sometimes. And given the gene pool, this is not a good thing. <laughs> but she has her own life, her own life in the fellowship. I have my life in my fellowship. And those lives come together in our home as the people show up. We sit out in the hot tub and talk about our sponsees. You know, how's Julie doing? You know, she's still with that asshole? You know? <laughs> Because we love these people. You know, I tell guys that I sponsor, I said, the best thing about having me as a sponsor is Karen. Because if she likes you, she'll feed you. Right? <laughs> and uh, I had a guy in our home group one time, he says, I was over at Cleveland's house so long the other day that I had two meals. You know? Because we'll f we feed people, you know? And uh, <clears throat> when I had the liver transplant, uh, I got real depressed. I've been really sick, profoundly sick, for about 10 years. Um, I'm as healthy as I've been in a long time right now. I'm doing well. I'm doing really well. But the caregiver pays a big price. And I, for a long time, I was very insensitive to that. She was just there. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how dark it got sometimes. I was dying. And after the surgery, I got real depressed and I got real nasty. I got mean. And I felt justified in it. You know, I, really to me, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of that is really blurry. But I know it happened. I was heavily medicated, not just on pain medications, steroids, antibiotics, all the stuff they put you on. And, 
and it brought the rage came back, the anger came back, and I got real nasty. And uh, and she stayed. A couple times she left the hospital in tears. And to, when I hear her side of it after now it's over, it just it pains me that I could treat her that way. But I can tell you this today. Are we intimate? Absolutely. I think I really experience it now. One of the things that happens with liver disease is you lose your libido. You lose your sex drive. And our sex life together, her and I, was very important to us. It was really, it was very profound. It was a wonderful thing. And it kept us together, actually, for a while. And, uh, and I lost that. This is before, long before the transplant. It all went away. And she read up on it and discovered that this was a side, this, this, this happens, it's a very real thing. And she came to me and she said, I understand what's going on. I understand why this is happening. And I didn't really, and she told me. And she says, please, don't stop touching me. Don't stop loving me, please. So what I do even today, things are a bit better, is I just walk by her in the kitchen. All she wants from me, when they say, you're not emotionally available for me, all she wants is to be acknowledged when she walks in the room, whether I'm watching television or not. All she wants is a little kiss on the neck when I'm walking through the kitchen. All she wants me to do is participate in her life with her. It's that simple. When you catch yourself when she walks in the room and you're watching the news and she says something to you and you feel bothered by her interrupting your TV watching, that's what she means. That's all she means. That's it. It's not real deep and profound, you know. You hear guys say, when she comes home from work, she always wants to talk to me. And I've been working, why does she want to talk all the time? The answer to that is, why don't you want to listen? Why don't I want to listen? What's wrong with me that the woman I love live with, and that I supposedly love that I don't want to listen to her? What's wrong with me? And what we say, men say, all they ever want to do is talk. What an awful thing to say about somebody. That's the way I was. Sometimes it still comes back. If what happened to us when we got sober is we were awakened, we're not sleeping anymore, the rest of the journey is that evolves into an awareness where I'm aware that I'm awake. that mean just people we sponsor with or just alcoholics that need our help? I don't think so. When it says practicing these principles in all of our affairs, why wouldn't we practice this with the person we live with? One quick story. She has a real problem with me eating food without a plate under it in the living room. <laughs> She has a real problem. She's just weird about this. It's a weird thing, right? So I'll tell you something. She wants me to get a plate underneath the crummy donut that I'm eating, right? Don't go get the plate. Don't give in to this. Because you know what happens? If you give in to that, then she's going to want you to take it back to the kitchen. <laughs> It, it escalates from there. She will want you to rinse it off. Then it gets worse. She'll want you to put it in the dishwasher. So don't go get the plate. This actually happened in my house. This is a true story. I was resistant to that. I, it's my house. I bought this house. I can eat if, you know, I'm a grown man. You can't oppress me with this crap. 
I mean, this is real conversations, real time, from a guru, an enlightened being. None of my sponsees would support this position. They all love her. They think I'm a fool, right? Which is awful. There's no support. And I finally had to ask myself the question, why, why would I not get a plate? Why would I not? I mean, it's not a big deal when you, in the scheme of things. Why don't I go get the plate? I go get the plate now. I take it back to the kitchen. I rinse it off. But I don't put it in the dishwasher. You know, come on, you got to hang on to something. You know. <laughs> But this little thing was, it was a dynamic in our relationship that was an ongoing thing. My resistance and her nagging. She's a nag. Her whole family will cop to it. She can't not support that. Once I started getting the plate, that disappeared. I love her. What is love? Love is action. It's what I do to show how I feel about somebody. Is it me giving in to her unreasonable demands? No. It's just me being a part of this relationship. It's not giving in to unreasonable demands. Her demands are not unreasonable. And that's what intimacy is to me. Feeling the other person. Being respectful. And really from a a place of desire, not forcing myself. It's like opening my heart up enough. She's not that different from me. But the differences are very intriguing. Thank you. (laughs) Steve Lamb, I'll call it. Uh, Chuck C. used to say there's only one problem and one solution. The problem is conscious separation. The solution is conscious union. Spiritual recovery. Union with what? The book tells us God. It uses a bunch of other terms, but it talks about God. Alan Watts calls it it. Well, what is it, and how do we find it? You know, in the first session, one of the things that I talked about was the concept of metanoia, that our minds are changed. We don't change our minds. Our minds are changed by a process. And one of the things that I'd like to do is is take you back in time a little bit. Everybody here has probably read about the certain American businessman, Roland Hazard. I'm going to get comfortable, you know? So I am arguing with a doctor about general anesthesia. Okay. <laughs> and Scott, Scott Redman used to say that only alcoholics get excited about general anesthesia because in the old days, and the old timers will know this, they used to give you the general anesthesia, tell you to count back from 100. You go 100, 99, 98, and we, we live for 99 and 98, right? But now, now they're really good. They gave me this stuff called propofil, which is what they gave Michael Jackson, but they gave me the correct dose. And, and what happens with propofil is you're here, and then you're here. There's no there. Yeah. It's disappointing, frankly. <laughs> but that's, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is when I got shot, I was on an AA retreat. Yeah, let that settle in for a while, right? It gets better. I was leading the retreat. I'd given a talk the night before on unity which I thought was pretty compelling, but apparently one guy wasn't buying into it. And uh, (laughs) the night that I was shot, I was shot in the morning. That evening I was supposed to give a talk on acceptance and forgiveness. (laughs) Yeah. But the best part, the guy that shot me, I sponsor him. (laughs) Yeah, that's a real crowd pleaser. No sponsee has ever even threatened to shoot me. But the reality is, this is a guy that I've been intimate with. He shared his fifth step with me. He knows a lot about me. I love this guy. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't I forgive him? 
I made a lot of mistakes before I got here, and I made a lot of mistakes since I've been here. Now, this is a big one, and if you're new, I suggest you do not shoot your sponsor. It's not a good thing, okay? <laughs> but that's not the point. That's not the point. And, and I've got to tell you, the other thing that's kind of funny about this is I, because I'm a lawyer and I argue and I, I, I manipulate people for a living, I, I'm in ICU, but I not only have my phone, I got my iPad, and I told the, the nurse is giving me a charging unit because I don't have one because, you know, you can't run out of power when you're in ICU. And I get a call, because I get calls all, all the time, I get a call the next morning from one of, the, one of the guys that I sponsor. And he says to me, he says, how you doing? I said, well, I've had better weekends. He says, uh, well, what's going on? I, I, and I tell him, I've been shot. He goes, man, really? I said, yeah, but I think I'll be out of here in a couple of days. I think I've stabilized. He goes, oh, okay. Well, let me tell you what she did now. <clears throat> now, if you're new, that's selfishness and self-centeredness. But the reality is his selfishness and self-centeredness combats my selfishness and self-centeredness. So when he talks about him, he gets me out of me. Okay, out of self into God. And after a while, when you sponsor enough people, eventually one of these men or women will call you up and they'll talk about somebody that they're trying to work with. And you'll spend the entire conversation where you realize I'm not talking about me and he's not talking about him. And I don't know what your definition of God consciousness is, but that's mine. That's mine. It's a big deal. Um, but I got to tell you, I mean, we, he talked about the, the clown suit, you know, being the ass clown. And, and, and our friend Scott <clears throat> hands out these clown noses from time to time just to remind us of what idiots we are. And, and I got to tell you, I got to give you an example of my ass clownishness and it's the biggest resentment that I had against my wife and it's going to sound immature and ridiculous because it is but it didn't happen to you it happened to me and what's going on is I got two to three years sober right I'm back in the big bed things are going pretty well but what my wife is doing is she's taking the trash and recycling and she's putting it out on the stoop every night for me to take so I'm the trash and recycling man I clearly have not been restored to full husband status I'm pissed. She obviously is, just, is not impressed with all the hard work that I've done for us. You know, she just doesn't get it, right? So I'm, I'm writing inventory. I'm pissed off. I'm reading inventory to Michael. And, and Michael asked me a question. He says, uh, well, have you talked to her about it? I said, well, no, no, I haven't talked to her about it, no. <laughs> now, I've been married for 35 years in a row. A little time off for bad behavior, but 35 years, okay? <laughs> and at the time, I'd been married over a decade. And Michael says, well, wh why haven't you talked to her? I said, well, Michael, I've been married for a long time, and I, I know what she's thinking before she's thinking it. <laughs> he says, well, we call that mind reading, <laughs> and it's a pretty significant character defect. But if you're not willing to look at that, you're going to have to talk to the big guy. You're going to have to go to God. You're going to have to pray, because this is a resentment. It's the number one offender. It's not a big deal if you're new. It'll just kill you dead. And you need to go ahead... <laughs> and get rid of this. And you're going to have to ask God for guidance and direction. So I'm praying and meditating. This case takes quite a while. And what comes to me is patience, tolerance, love, and understanding. You hear it in the rooms all the time. It's in the big book. But I don't hear it for a long time. It's kind of like, you ever been to a meeting with a guy, you've been working with a guy for months, and you've been telling him whatever, you know, do, do amends, do inventory, whatever. You cannot get this guy to budge. And then some chucklehead gets up there and gives a talk. A chucklehead like me and talks about whatever. And you go out for pie or coffee, and the sponsee goes, you know, I heard that guy talk. I think I ought to try that. And you go, man, I've been telling you that for six months, right? And they, they just don't hear it until they hear it. So I, I get this patience, tolerance, understanding. I ask for it. I get it. I get it. I'm good. You know, I got the trash recycling. I'm taking it out every day. You know, I'm a man of God. Just ask me. I'll tell you. And by the way, because I'm so spiritual, I've got to tell all the sponsees that i got what great work I've done working through this resentment, right? Because it's all about me. And I'm taking out the trash and recycling. Everything's going well. I, every, I twitch every once in a while, but I'm not writing any more inventory. It's good. This goes on for, I don't know, six, seven years, eight years. We, we get, we, a little, I'm a little slow, okay? We get a dog, Zoe. She just passed away a little while ago, but we had this dog for ten years. Now, dogs do what dogs do. I take her out for a walk. She poops. I put it in a bag. I throw it in the trash. On evenings that I go to a meeting, my wife will take her out in the backyard. She'll poop. 
and uh, Zoe will poop, not my wife. Zoe will poop. Uh, well, I, I wanted to be clear. You know? Boy, I got a quick and dangerous mind. But anyway, uh, my dog will poo, and my wife will put it in a bag. But does she put it in the trash? No. You know, right, sir? She puts with trash recycling on the stoop for me. So I'm spiritual, I'm a man of God, but now I got dog crap. Michael, I got dog crap, dog crap. I know what that means, dog crap. Well, he goes, well, have you talked to her? Well, no, no, I haven't talked to her. No. <laughs> well, you're going to have to pray and meditate. You have to talk to God. So same thing, same drill, same answer. Patience, tolerance, love, and understanding. I get it, I got it, no problem. Now I'm doing the trash recycling and poop. I'm a man of God, no problem. I'm telling all the guys what great work I've done, working through this. This goes on for years. You know, this is two or three year, two three years from now. I go out the front door instead of the side door. The side door is where the porch is, where the trash recycling and poop is. So I don't get it. I go to work. It's a Monday. My home group is the Hermosa Beach Men's Stag, and I got to go to my home group that night. So I, I realize at work, God, I didn't, I didn't do my job. I got to make amends. So I'm at home. We're having dinner. I got the wife, got the girls there, and, uh, and, and the dog. And uh, I tell my wife. I say, uh, you know, Lynn, you, you probably noticed this morning I went out the front door. I didn't go out the side door. I did not get the trash recycling and poop. I, I know that's my job. I apologize. I'll do better next time. She goes, what? I've read the book. I've been taught to pause when agitated. So I slow down. I say, uh, you know, baby, you know, the trash recycling and poop. I know it's my job. I didn't get it this morning, and, and I'll do better the next time. She goes, what are you talking about? So now my head's doing a little rotisserie, right? So I pause when agitated, and I tell her real slow. And by the way, guys, they love that when you talk to them real slow, right? And I go through it one more time, and she gives me a look like, uh, you been drinking? You know, and, uh, and she says, Steve, you know we got possums and raccoon out there, and, and uh, you know it's, it's creepy out there at night. I don't like to go out by the recycling and trash bins. We've even had coyotes that have been coming down from Palos Verdes. They've been taking some of the cats and small dogs, and I don't like to go out there at night, so I, I put that on the stoop at night. I figure I'll get it in the morning, or the girls will get it in the morning, or you'll get it in the morning, but I do not leave that there for you. Like I said, a little slow on the uptake. Newsflash. So now I suddenly realize that I've had a resentment that I believe that I've worked through that has no basis in fact, okay? <laughs> and I've told all my sponsees about the brilliant work that I've done for over a decade, right? So I look at my lovely wife and I go, love you, babe, got to go. Because I can't talk to her about this, right? I've got to go to my home group. I've got to talk to my sponsor because he will understand, right? Wrong. He thinks it's hilarious, you know. He wants to tell all the newcomers what I've done. Hey, Lamb, tell him. No, tell him. No, no, I don't. No, you tell him. You tell him what you did, right? And I'm just beside myself. And I go, oh my God, Michael. And he's laughing at me. And he says, Lamb, that's why we call it a delusion. And I remember that years ago he had told me that in, L in AA, a lot of times people will talk about denial, 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 you know. Crossing the River of Denial. There's a story in the fourth edition, Crossing the River of Denial. But, but denial is not in the first 164 pages. It's not in the 12 and 12. It's really not an AA term. Delusion's the AA term. It's not that we don't suffer from denial, but in denial, I know the truth. I just like the lie, and I'm trying to convince you of the lie. In delusion, you all know the truth. I didn't get the memo. I don't know. I think it's real. It's much more insidious. It's much more dangerous because we're not aware of it. It's like spiritual pride. You all realize I'm an ass clown. I think God's talking to me. It's scary. <laughs> it's scary. should live your own life if not yourself. So, lot, so live yourselves. The signposts have fallen. Do not be greedy to gobble up the fruits of foreign fields. Do you not know that you yourselves are the fertile acre which bears everything that avails you? There is only one way, and that is your way. You seek the path, 
I warn you a way from my own. It can also be the wrong way for you. May each go his own way. And then he concluded in one of his letters, Carl Jung said, your, your vision will become clear only when you look into your heart. Who looks outside dreams. Who looks inside awakens. So what happens is we look inside each other. And through service we find ourselves. We find the great reality deep within. And what is it? You've all experienced it this weekend. It's a great big laughing love, as Cliff Roach used to say. It's a union of me with you and with God. And once it's been experienced, what Sandy Beach used to tell me is, you cannot not give it away. So go forth and multiply and have fun. Thank you. Just a quickie. What we've talked about this weekend is kind of the core of our message, I believe, is working with others is the mechanism that's used to bring us into the light. If we don't do that, I don't think it happens. If you don't enter into my life at some level, I'll never learn these lessons. I'll never grow up emotionally. I'll hang on to my prejudices, my opinions, and I won't have any interaction with anything outside of that and nothing will change. I'll hang on to those opinions and believe that I'm right. And I can offer you this, I can tell you this, my own personal experience is that if you open your heart to this work, if you let the people in, all of them, without any filter, whatever prejudice you have will walk across the room and ask you for help. Now you have a decision. If you want to hang on to the opinion of the prejudice, send it away. And you can find a lot of support for that here. I don't work with this kind of person or that kind of person. I don't work with drug addicts. I don't, do this. I, don't do, I don't work with people on medication. I wasn't trained that way. You let them all in because I have no idea why you're sent to me. But I don't think it's ever a mistake. So this guy walked across the room and he asked me to sponsor him. He says, I'm gay. And I said, wouldn't you rather have a gay sponsor? And he says, no. He says, I got the gay thing down pretty good. <laughs> you know. But drinking is an issue. <laughs> you know. Who knew? You know. I used to stand up at podiums and I'd say that if you were on medication, you weren't sober. I didn't know anything about that, but I don't require actual experience or information <laughs> to form an opinion. I can just do it on the fly. And I heard some of you do that, and it seemed like a real right-wing, badass opinion to have. So I just picked it up and started, and they gave, you gave me a forum, you know, so I just started saying stuff like that. Then the guy walked across the room, and he asked me for help, and he said, I think I should tell you I'm bipolar, and I'm on medication. Jeez. But you'd never say no. I was raised with you don't ever, because you don't know. I don't know why you're sent to me. Maybe you need to hang on to me for a while until you find the right guy to be with. You know, that's happened to me a lot over the years. You know, I don't know how I'm supposed to be used. It's not up to me to filter you out. I don't know why you've been sent to me. Doesn't look like we're a match. Some of those people that don't look like we're a match are my closest, dearest friends today. So I said yes to this guy, and I had the experience of peeling him off the ceiling and lifting him up off the floor. One time he came, 40-year-old grown man, came across my living room, curled up in my lap and put his head in my neck and just started crying like a little baby at the pain of being alive. And I just held him and rocked him. And Karen walked through the living room. She goes, whoa. <laughs> I mean, that'll get your attention. Now when I see that guy coming, I go, have you taken your medication? <laughs> you have issues, you know. So then after that, then I determined I'm a doctor now, so I can start prescribing. You know, the, the pendulum swings all over hell, you know. I said, but the truth is, I had an opinion. Then I, I had an experience, and it changed my opinion, you know. I think that's how it works. You know, you come in, I used to think I was the teacher, you're the student. <laughs> no, <laughs> truly, honestly. You're the teacher. Sometimes I am too. 
but you're the teacher. You get sent to me. That's how I learned intimacy. That's how I learned compassion. That's how it, it was something that was missing in me that had been never developed, and you entered my life, and I was all ego-driven initially, you know, making myself look good, couldn't laugh at myself, and then I started falling in love with you. Just the experience of doing, irrespective of what the motivation is. At some point in our sobriety, we have to start looking at motivation, but initially you just start doing it because it's experiential, it's not intellectual. You know, and I started falling in love with you and I started caring what happened to you. Then slowly I brought that home into my own home. Slowly. You know, but you were the catalyst. You opened my heart. Without you, none of this would happen. I want to thank you all very much for a really, really wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Do the Lord's Prayer. We're going to do the Lord's Prayer. We're Lord's Prayer. Lord's Prayer. <laughs>